are we? So you had some questions. So why don't you ask your questions? Francis? Yeah. Francis oh. or Ricardo? Well, you know, like in, on this on this on this process, you know, when it was presented to me, it looked very big and it looked very intriguing, intriguingly big. And uh, I guess for me, I just need right now, you know, as being a planner, I just have to see feel what the vision is and the overview and uh, the type of operations you plan on setting up and the the outreach you want to do and and something like uh, what's the physical plant going to look like you know just like i have know nothing at all about this and you know giving me a portrait of what uh we're going to look at as an intriguing uh operation that's going to train deaf people right okay that's enough for right now let him just respond and he, and he will share back with you okay okay Hi. So Hi. She, Sheila's talking for Francis and he says it's wonderful to be in, in conversation with all of you and you're asking what the vision is and we want to make sure that we can try to connect. So in order to introduce myself and my organization, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. It's a little slow, the speed, so I'm having trouble reading everything. He says, I, I teach at a high school in Menlo Park in Silicon Valley, and I help set up an organization, an NGO called Give Back to the Community in Zambia, which is G-B-C-Z, Give Back to the Community in Zambia. That's my... Uh -huh. So my life story is a little complicated. Um, so in order to, I wanted to give back to my homeland in Zambia where I grew up. And I, we had our first uh, national leadership training with deaf leaders in the country of Zambia last summer in August. And we came from the States and I brought a team and we talked about how to improve the deaf education system because um, in Zambia, not all the teachers of the deaf know sign language. Mm -hmm. And so what often happens is a lot of deaf Zambian children get lost in the mainstream and they don't even, teachers often don't even know that they might have a hearing loss or what to do. So there's a lot we would like to do in bringing American deaf education practices to Zambia and ways to help identify and gather the deaf students all together to start introducing them to sign language and into kind of a signing village concept. So Often these children are taken advantage of, are abused in lots of different ways, physically, sexually, emotionally. Often the kids don't even know that who their parents are. They don't learn basic concepts because they don't have the communication link. Mm -hmm. So they have all kinds of delays. So we want mm -hmm. to bring more advocacy and we're working with the Zambian government and 45 we had 45 deaf leaders throughout the country of Zambia gather with my team uh, last summer, August. And at that summit, we discussed how we can help deaf children and teenagers in Zambia. Uh -huh. And so what we, we feel that there's a lot we can do working together. And so what we came up with was first was to develop a deaf education curriculum so that, mm -hmm. so that we're all on the same page. And also, he's, his speed is really slow, you guys. He's signing really slow, so I can't, I'm having a hard time. No problem, no problem. Give, yeah. me just, mm -hmm. give me just a minute. 
Give me, Francis, mm -hmm. you can see me. You're a little bit frozen and speed a little bit slow. So I'm, so let's see if can. You said that first is to develop deaf education curriculum. You're trying to copy American deaf education curriculum. So that's right. We're, we're trying to adapt the more sophisticated deaf education curriculum we have in America to Zambia. Secondly, we want to develop an interpreting agency because that's our bridge builders to connect the deaf community to the hearing community. And we need to have better interpreting because that means that deaf people can have more access to the society in general and to get more university training and all kinds of things. So we need to start from the bottom up. And, and, and the second thing is to develop a high quality interpreter training program and agency to provide excellent interpreting in sign language, between sign language and, and Zambian uh, spoken language. So we're working oh. on a dictionary and, and a curriculum for, for that. So thirdly, we want to set up a school, a school for the deaf in Zambia, between the grades from K to 12. From seventh grade or seven years old. Again, the grade. So now Zambia, the grade is to seventh grade only, and we want to expand so that they have it all the way to 12th grade. So we want um, the kids to be able to have middle school and high school. Most of, most of the deaf kids are stuck at home or they're homeless on the street. We want to be able to provide three meals a day, a residential program that they can stay at the school. And we want we're looking for funding um, in order to start a school. And we have an organization. You, you, you said you have an organization supporting or you're looking for? We do have an organization that has offered, one organization offered to that I'm working with and collaborating with says that, so this organization is called Mass Group. What's it called? Um, hold on one second. What's it called? Hang on just a second. He's Boston? signing okay. here in America. So this is a group in Boston and it's, oh, in Massachusetts. And so, the name of the organization is the Massachusetts Massachusetts Group, and it's a it's archi architectural architectural. So it's Massachusetts Group Architectural Organization, something like that. And they are interested in helping us develop and build the school. So wait, wait, wait. So Francis, you, you told me that the Zambian government already gave you land. Okay. So first, Francis wants First, he wants to give you more of the conceptual program approach before he gets into the, the actual land itself. So you have that group in Massachusetts helping you with the, with the blueprint and working on the, the planning of how to set up and, and, and design your, your school. So they, yes, that's correct. So... Uh -huh. They have money or they were working on a grant to Okay, 
Okay. So, so the problem, so the problem, the problem is, is that uh, the students in Zambia for deaf programming only goes up to seventh grade, but his organization talked to the Zambian government about where the kid's going to go after seventh grade. So then, so now the Zambian government said that they wanted to donate land, which they've already done, donated land for us to build the school. So we have plans, we're making plans with this Massachusetts architectural organization and partnering with them to just starting to design the school. So Got it. Designing the school and you said hospital. Mm -hmm. And we're also wanting to have a goal of des designing a hospital and making sure there's teacher training so that the teachers can use sign language effectively with their students. And then we need to have interpreters and ways that the hospital can better serve the deaf students so that they're healthy, they're educated, they, they have their own community and mm -hmm. that So now the third thing is a, a battered women's shelter or some kind of safe house because there's a lot of deaf women with their kids who have been abused and there's no structure for them to get support. And I've had deaf students that I grew up with, deaf women who are in this situation with their own kids that are my own classmates at this age of life, the stage of life that we're at now where they don't get a chance to get training, to get jobs and the support they should get. So Sheila, so the safe house, say more, your friends experience that. And then the next, we're working on starting a small safe house. Do we wanna do Two, 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 two small safe houses, two small mm -hmm. in different cities. In different cities? Yeah, two, but, but one will be near the school and hospital. One safe house will be near in the future. Okay. He says so. I'm not quite, the speed is affecting his signing. It's hard for me to read his signing because it's, it's really a strange distorted speed that I'm dealing with. So you said that the safe houses really are separate from the school. Okay, so for right now, okay. For right now, what he's describing about the school and the hospital as creating kind of a village uh, approach is one project. The two safe one. Houses, the two safe okay. houses are a separate second project, but in the future, okay. in the future, they envision having safe houses and the school and the hospital connected, or mm. creating a you know the, a bigger village of programs and uh -huh. a more holistic community. So you want to. So is everybody following me? You have any questions before? What's the next question? Ready for the next question. Ricardo. Oh. Yeah. yeah, Ricardo, so do you have more questions? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, ma'am, I, I do. I got, uh, I'm just gonna try and, it, uh, to, to visualize this, you know, in my head. And uh, I, I guess it's, uh, the structures are more than just one structure. You got the school, a hospital, and a second project with a, uh, uh, two small safe houses and things like that. So uh, let me just tell That's you, what, you what, I, what, what I do so um, to see if there's any uh, 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 
uh, let's see, synergy or the type of work that I do can fit into what you do. See if there's any, you know, strategic fits or any good suggestions that I might offer. You know, for just to give you an example, you know, uh, when you talk about a hospital, yes. since we were since we were fundamentally the the principals in building a a health and wellness center in our community with the idea that you would have a continuity of care, not just for treatment or, or, or chronic things, but also that would serve for prevention, for nutrition, uh, uh, for mental health and things like that. So we decided that for just for uh, 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 marketing purposes and just for people understanding that health is a lifelong learning process, we decided to call it a health and wellness center and, and instead of a hospital. So you might want to consider that, you know, if you're looking at a holistic construct and that involves, you know, different parts, you know, uh, of, uh, of the health industry, you know, it, it, I guess being American is complicated over here. So uh, I would, Mm, you know, I would have an idea. I don't have an idea of what it would look like in Zambia, but, you know, if I was to start from the roots, I, you know, I would look at, you know, how do you take care of the whole child? You know, how do you take care of the whole family? How do you nurture the mother, you know, and, and provide the best possible health in, in, in a preventive sense so you won't have to go to hospital for chronic diseases and things like that? That's just one suggestion. But, um, Tell them also, Carter, tell them about the Natural Birth Center, too. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. And, and I, well, we've been so successful in doing what we have, you know, and matter of fact, we're sort of like a marquee organization that we were able to start a natural birth center, you know, and to serve the entire area, you know. And this is a starting point of making families healthy, making families whole. It's a starting point by uh, having mothers deliver their children as natural as possible and whatnot. So, uh, you know, we're establishing new grounds here and that might be something that you want to consider over there, natural birth. Now he says, um, he's saying, yes, you have, he says, amen to everything you're saying. That's exactly the same vision that you know, mm -hmm. he likes your idea of renaming instead of calling it a hospital. Health and wellness is really how we think of helping the whole kid and the whole family with prevention as well as, you know, yeah. chronic conditions. Yeah. And that, hang on, uh, just, hang on just a second. So that what we want to do is provide support and... so that everybody's well-educated, well-informed, they know how to take care of themselves, more self-determination, and that we just really wanna make sure that we have an open door um, approach in the sense that we're ready to help the community wherever they are and help mm -hmm. them learn all the things they need to learn and become, to become more successful in a holistic way like you're describing. You have the land. Are, are there any buildings on the land right now? Well, we're getting ready. We're, we're getting ready to, to get a grant to, to support us. And so, Um, how, how many acres? Hang, hang on one second. So the grant, you know, we need to be able to be clear in the grant process about our vision and how to to develop this whole project and 
the school would be a centerpiece because it would basically the outreach it's our way to do outreach the, the community comes at a young mm -hmm. age and basically grows up at the, in the heart that's sort of the heart of, of the of, of the project and it would be the school would be the first building and program you want to set up you mm -hmm. think so he says yeah the school is our first focus first vision because and it'd be residential okay because the Let school me hang on hang on So then we need a, you know, classrooms, we need a dormitory or dormitories, we need to feed them a dining room and, you know, multi-purpose room. So, you know, a whole residential. Yeah, I got you. And plus, then you want to have health and wellness to support them in their, in their education and giving them information of how to live, not just academics. Yeah. Um, well. Also, Okay, Ricardo, go ahead. Well, this is why I wanted Felicia. Felicia, you still there? Yep. Uh, uh, this is why I wanted Felicia in on this because you're dealing with multiple systems, you know, and like for in our community, we're talking about, um, uh, you know, the civic systems or the governance, you know, to run this type of place. And we're talking about the environmental circumstances. You, you're talking about the other civic things like, uh, how's the government of Zambia going to support you? What kind of policy, what are they looking for? What kind of returns do they need to see, you know, uh, you know, to be fully robustly supporting, you know, this operation. And I don't know what kind of environmental hazards that you might have or what uh, kind of environmental barriers you have. Then you, uh, uh, if it's residential, that's going to be housing, and housing comes with, along with its own policies and its own safeguards and its own problems. But be, uh, and be, I'm going to ask Felicia to pipe in. But first, I must say that generally speaking, you know, when we start these things, and my, my organization was called Isoji, which meant, uh, which means a uh, uh, renaissance or uh, revitalization. You know, we start off with a think tank or what we call what in our language now is called collective impact design team because we have to look at how all these things interplay with one another. And then we have to really sit down and hash it out, all the implications, you know, the legal, the things that I just mentioned, the higher. And then you start, you know, with a, a blueprint or a, uh, a plan and whatnot. And like Felicia and I, we're working on accountability systems, but she works on systems, period, and whatnot. And she would have, probably have a better vision of how these things are pieced together and made into, you know, how we can develop the connectivity between all of these things that you have to do. I, it's, this is new in the sense that you're requiring land in the sense that you want to build on the land, in the sense that you have to integrate with government, and in the sense that you have to integrate specifically and very poignantly with the population that you're going to serve. And that's where your feedback, that's where your feedback is going to come, you know, in two years down the road. How are these people going to feel? How integrated are they with the rest of, you know, society? Uh, are the teaching methods that we transport from America or wherever we get, Europe or anything like that, you want to get the best practices possible, you know, and how you think, what kind of technology do you need? I mean, there's a lot of things that, uh, uh, we, you know, that uh, people who are invested in this really should have to sit down and think through. And it's not, it's not a, a, a two hour conversation. It takes time. Felicia? Yeah, I'm just making a couple of notes. Um, if Felicia, could you introduce yourself, please, and your background? That would help us, too. Sure. sure. So um, first, Francis, thank you for um, sharing your, your vision. Um, yes. 
it was it, it's a beautiful vision and very uplifting to hear um it's, Hold it's on one second, Ricardo, i'm going to mute you and when you want to talk just put your cursor in the thing and unmute yourself he doesn't have a cursor because he's on the phone oh right okay so i'm going to unmute you um just for a moment while felicia talks go ahead um so ricardo i think you're thing might have been creating some feedback so she was muting you for a moment um so i just wanted to say it it sounds on the one hand like a, a very genuinely sad and and challenging situation and also it was it was just really uplifting for me to hear the vision that you're that you're working on so thank you for sharing that um so i promote systems thinking in marin county I have a, a one person nonprofit experiment in Marin County called Systems Thinking Marin. And I, um, Systems Thinking, I don't, are you familiar with it? it with the, it's, it's a big, huge, it's a world view, not so much a field. Most, yeah, most people are not familiar with Systems Thinking. Um, so I have a, a challenging job because I'm promoting systems thinking, which most people have not heard of. I'm also promoting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals of 2030. Are, are you familiar with the goals, the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Great. So for anybody who's hang not. On, hang on, Felicia, one second. Sustainable what goals? Uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, he says, I'm not, he says, I might have heard a little bit about it, but I can't say that I know a lot about it. Oh, so you're, see the picture? Can you show that again, please? So that's, so that's at the UN, uh, is it on yep. the UN website like yep. that? If I can spotlight her. There. Is that better? I get the numbers. Maybe you could give us a little taste of what one, two, three is just as an example. Sure. So number one is no poverty by 2030. Number two is zero hunger by 2030. Number three is good health and well-being for all. Number four is um, quality education for all. Number five is gender equity. And I won't go through all 17. <laughs> But I wanted to mention, so my first point is systems thinking, I'm promoting it in Marin County and most people have never heard of systems thinking. I'm also promoting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and most people have never heard of <laughs> Sustainable Development Goals. <laughs> um, so I mention in particular um, the goals because hearing you about your project, I think to myself, um, how would this project help Zambia to meet these goals? That I assume Zambia has officially signed on to because all 193 member countries of the United Nations endorsed the goals in 2015. So if Zambia is a member of the United Nations, theoretically, yes, it is. Be, he says it is great, then there should be some politicians up there somewhere who and it sounds like some people ha are already supporting this initiative within the government, your project would help Zambia to meet these goals. And that's one way you might be able to position it when you're seeking funding or further support. That how you can use for support and writing a proposal for money. So maybe, um, Francis, maybe you can explain to her about the ILO and your relationship. You've heard about the ILO, Felicia? Mm hmm So a, li a little bit. A little bit. So, so hang on one second. Wait. 
So the ILO is a UN-based um, So, so sustainable goals is probably related to the ILO too. And Zambian government has been very uh, interested in collaborating and part partnering with the ILO. Who, hang on just a second. Zambia or in UN or ILO, which organization? Zambian government. Zambian government wants to work with the ILO. That's what you said. And specific about deaf. Um. The people who've been making decisions about the deaf students in Zambia are not knowledgeable about successful deaf types of programs, deaf education programs. And so I've been educating and talking to the Zambian government and I've been connected to the ILO. ILO means International Labor, ILO means International Labor Organization. <clears throat> and if you look at the ILO mission and vision, it's about jobs, 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 and economic development. And they have a lot of resources. And they spotlighted um, Francis's work in Zambia last August through their ILO that was based in Zambia that serves the country of Zambia and two other countries in Africa and they immediately contacted the headquarters in at the UN and the UN in Geneva they have a newsletter they send out worldwide and they featured the work that he did last summer with the deaf leadership and then he was chosen because the ILO just celebrated a 100 year anniversary and chose 30 people to, to, to showcase, is that right? ILO, they're 100. Hang on one second. He's looking at something on his screen. Francis, so I'm not sure. Can he see me? Yeah, he just waved his hand. So Francis, you said ILO celebrating 100 years, they picked 30 people. So he's sharing, uh, oh, he's going to share it on the screen with you. So the ILO headquarters chose his project as a, you know, disabled related, disability related project as a part of the 30 that they used to celebrate their 100 year anniversary. And they had a CNN, you know, camera person come and interview him to get his, his program um, into a, a position to be featured as a, as a demonstration program, you know, as a pilot that, of how a deaf leader from Zambia went to America and got educated and brought all these resources back home. Um, and the ILO helped him when he was homeless uh, when he was in high school, he wasn't able to maybe graduate, but he was able to get help from the ILO as a, as a high school student. So the ILO is extremely proud of what their investment has brought back to Zambia. And, you know, Francis was telling me that just even Zambian hearing people don't often come back home to give back to the community. So because of sign language, what, He's, while he's looking, I'm just going to give you, Sheila's going to share some of the things that he's been telling me, is that he has to do a lot of basic building blocks. Because right now, there's basically not a good university program to train teachers of the deaf. So he has to go back to square one and do all kinds of things. Tell, tell me also when Francis uh, got deaf. He was a malaria, right? Right. He, he was 
became deaf when he was, um, malaria affected his family. He lost his mother to malaria. Wow. He lost a lot of relatives. And then he got malaria. And then the medicine that he was given made him <laughs> deaf. The, the side effects of the medicine when he was like seven. Oh, wow. This is, this is, the, uh, this is the, the footage. He's showing you this, this the ILO had a CNN uh, camera person come in and film him talk about his work and his life. So he's just showing you the, the video so that you can, hopefully you can read it. I wrote down the URL so I can go back to it. Okay. And this is also being recorded and I will be uploading it on to, up to YouTube and then I'll send you guys all the YouTubes. Um, okay. It looks like it's, it's, uh, let me, frozen. let me, like, Francis, Francis. So Felicia said that she, will put down the URL and go look at that video after. And Christy is telling that she can, um, she's recording this conversation for YouTube channel for Ricardo to, and then you might be able to add this video to Christy. Yes. So, so Christy will add your video URL She'll tr transfer onto the YouTube, and he says, "Please feel free to share uh, as needed. You feel yeah. they can." And um, yeah, Ricardo, I just unmuted you in case you have any questions that you want to ask at this time. Oh, oh I, was, I was going to ask, "Am I am I unmuted? Can you hear me?" Yes, we can hear you. Oh, uh, okay. You know, uh, I just this is to Felicia. Have you heard of the ILO? Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Thanks. Okay, okay. And I had another question for Francis. Okay, so back to who's next to talk. Well, I just want to—I just wanted to echo what Felicia said about the genuineness and the the the, the needed compassion that is being exhibited, you know, to, to do this type of work and whatnot. And as a person who is always engaged in all different type of levels of social justice since I got out of my, oh, I, I should give you a real quick brief background who I am. I was born and raised in Detroit. I was a musician back there and I joined the military and stayed in for 22 years and retired and came out to California to work, uh, work my way up through the, through a community, learning all aspects of community until I reach the stage where I think I know communities quite well and, and, and to the degree where it was a self-education on learning how communities actually work from inside, particularly poor and oppressed communities. And I'm always interested in the things that the techniques and the, you know, processes that can get to people who often don't have a voice you know, in these matters, you know, and particularly poor people, but poor, I, I at risk people and the severely undereducated people and seniors. But in this case, this is a new element because I don't think we've ever dealt with deaf, deaf people in, in our community. So I, <laughs> I'll just add this, you know, to my lexicon of knowledge and, and for any future encounters, I can always point to this as being an example of people who are doing something really proactive that we like, you know, so thank you for uh, uh, letting us engage with this process. But on the other end, I'm more like so, a, 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 also, a also Ricardo, Ricardo Francis says, this is not a solo adventure, right? It's we're all com in community together. We're all about empowering each other and community and all connecting the dots as one large community worldwide, right? Isn't that the goal? Exactly. Exactly. You know, you and, know whatever uh, I'll hang on one second. So go ahead. Go ahead, Ricardo. No, that's no, whatever I gain in knowledge. I am more than willing and will transfer. That's why I brought Felicia in on this because God, you, we've been kicking it around for the, like the last half year about how to introduce systems that work efficiently. You know, and in her case, how to combine it to the UN mandates. In my case, how to create a community plan that is holistic, that is uh, wraparound, 
you know, uh, uh, where we use the term the community and its organizations, its um, service delivery uh, programs and services, which I call, and I label this as a community operating infrastructure, because that's what makes all the activities go. And that, and that includes government and its need for refuge and recreation and lights and electricity. And it includes the uh, uh, economic development community with the cr job creations, what you were talking about, what we alluded to. And it certainly includes the health industries, you know, which, in, which is the mental health. Uh, uh, um, and one area that I'm partic particularly interested in how to use the arts as because of its inherent capacity for communication, uh, for healing, uh, uh, for learning. And, you know, I always feel that if we create a village, arts has to be a vital part of that because it's a stress reliever. It, 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 it brings out the creativity in people. It allows people to free themselves up from the mundane task of living. And to do things creatively, which adds to the things that it can do academically, which adds to the things that it can develop as skills and whatnot. So, you know, and that is part, it's, you know, this plugs into the holistic picture of what humans should be about, you know, and arts is a share thing, too. And uh, Francis has a big smile and he's saying, amen, amen, amen. <laughs> <laughs> just, to, just to let you know. Um, I don't know if Felicia knows the EMeth program. Are no, you? What, what was it called again? It's called EMeth, and EMeth is is um, how to help entrepreneurs to uh, create systems so that they get a higher by look when they look down. They're not looking at the small thing; they're looking at the overview of everything that affects their business, so that they're working. Is they're working on their business instead of working in their business on one small thing and then this goes and that goes. <laughs> Could you spell that? Yeah, it's E, the big capital E hyphen myth. Um, and there's a book on it written by, um, I have a copy of it here. I'll get it in a second. But um, one of the things for the ending poverty program that, um, Ricardo develop and I'm going to put you on mute for a second Ricardo and then you can I'll time you in in a second um, uh, <laughs> Ricardo as a part of his health and wellness developed a program called the defenders program which is we're working with the young at-risk men and they taught them entrepreneurial skills so they these young guys were learning how to make a business, develop a business, become entrepreneurs, learn entrepreneurial skills so they could be self-realized in their own capacity to earn and make money through entrepreneurial tasks and entrepreneurial projects. And um, they did a study with the first 50 kids that came out. The statistics were phenomenal about the improvement in test scores. And he'll tell you in a second as soon as I take him off mute. And also the, um, the improvement in um, home life was like amazingly better home life with these young boys were being more integrated, more participatory in their community and in their, and um, so we had at our Martin Luther King, you came to, the, it wasn't this the one you came to, but the one after, um, we had his boys come to be our speakers and they just just blew everybody away. Young black men who were just very inspiring um, with the way that they were, uh, you know, taking on life and their points of view and their philosophy and being honest with a room full of about 100 people. So anyway, that, that he's really helping them with the Defenders program. So you're unmuted now, Ricardo. Oh, well, I got to make a correction here. Okay. Before, I, I get, I before, somebody, before somebody, you know, uh, hog ties me and drag me through the sand. Uh, I was on the board of directors when we adopted that program. Yeah, I, I was one of the founders of the Health and Wellness Center and served on the board for about eight or nine, ten years, something like that. Yeah. And that you're talking about Zara, you know, yes. who is a great, I mean, really great facilitator 
and it, it, he empathizes with young people right off the bat. You know, yeah, and he, he was he, he was the head honcho of that, and I, I I would just vote very strongly to adopt that program, uh, uh, Defenders. And uh, there was a uh, there was a girls program. It kind of petered out for some reason, and, and it goes to a greater point that I'm always interested in is if you have good leaders, if you have good managers, and even in this endeavor, you're going to run across, you may run across some good managers and you're going to run across some bad managers or some flaky ones and whatnot. It is vitally, vitally important that you have, you know, good managers like we had, you know, in the community to run these organizations that like people. You know, you have to be likable, but you can also be a a, a, a a workaholic. But you have your relationship, and, and Felicia will back me up on this, it's about relationships. And if you get things done through the the cooperative and the spiritual aspect of relationship, it just takes you so much further. And at the end of the day, we had, you know, we had a doctor come in who was a wonk. <laughs> I mean, he really was a taskmaster, but he took us through all the, the, the technical aspects of becoming a federally qualified health center, all the regulations and sub-regulations. And to run a wellness clinic, it is not, believe me, it is not an easy job. You know, none of this, what we're doing is going to be easy. Um, uh, and it could make the work load lighter if, if the managers are well trained, they 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 they're people oriented, and they have a good work ethic. Point. So, so Francis wanted to want to say anything, Francis? Because Felicia could have talked. So Felicia, go ahead. Can I. You okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Felicia. I'll sign. Go ahead. I, I need to, to get off the call within about 10 minutes. Oh, thank you, Christy, for showing the book. That makes it very clear. <laughs> A book. Okay, great. Can you read the subtitle on the book, please? Yeah, it says, Why Small Businesses Don't Work and What to Do About It. It's by Michael Gerber. Great. And he does a training program, and... I uh, worked with his company on doing a baseline data uh, evaluation system uh, to try to determine, um, you know, what was, what the companies were saying was wrong and what, how they weren't thriving. And then a year later to measure um, as they put in all the systems in place because it's all systems development. And instead of like, oh, I don't have good employees. No, you don't have good systems. And mm -hmm. once they put in the good systems and looked at the systems that they were running, then they found out that suddenly they had good employees. <laughs> and maybe they thought they were going to have to fire 10 people. They only had to fire one. <laughs> you know, And uh, they were able to turn people around because the people understood how the system worked and it integrated everything and the, the business became more streamlined. People were getting their needs met and they were able to evaluate and assess what they called um, and their implementation system. And then they orchestrate the innovations that need to happen. And the people had a way to input into the system to help the system or orchestrate to the next level what the new system would be to improve on it. And um, it's a really great um, thing. And they have all these wonderful training programs. They have an online presence as well, and all kinds of stuff. So you can go to emeth.org, I believe, is the website. Christy, I'm just suddenly realizing I might have virtually met you before. Do you know Susan Clark? So, yeah, that sounds familiar. Um, I'm, I'm pretty, I feel like I was on a call with you and Susan Clark once in the past, something about voter registration. Um, Does that ring any bells? <laughs> no. I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe. I don't know. I'll check with so, Susan and see if. So Felicia, um, um, Francis, I'd like to introduce myself. This is Sheila, just to introduce my background to give you 
an idea why I'm working with Francis and some of the work that Christy and I have been talking about, just, and also Ricardo, just to, to, to hear a little bit about my, my background. So I'm an MFT, marriage and family therapist, for 30 years working with underserved communities. And um, my goal has been to empower leaders of various underserved communities, how to successfully help families faster because I work with family as my measurement of units within a community because I, because we use family systems thinking. Oh, wow. And so I'm an expert in dysfunctional family patterns of dysfunctional transmission over several generations. Wow. That's my, that's my, uh, one of my um, areas of expertise. So deafness cuts across all lines. So I've had to figure out how to apply a lot of principles to a lot of diversity. So I also helped set up an organization and a movement over the last 30 years for hearing children of deaf parents. So my parents were deaf and my dad was a well-known American deaf leader and author. My mother was the first deaf teacher in the Oakland public school system, my deaf sister, is the Gallaudet University Outreach Director. So I have, I have a lot of deaf relatives going back several generations. My deaf grandfather helped set up the California Association of the Deaf in 1906. So there's, wow. a, <laughs> there's a lot that um, I've been asked to do as this organization, CODA, Children of Deaf Adults, has spread around the world. And we, we're meeting CODAs from many African countries that I got to meet and I know uh, Francis. So we're trying to see what we can do because there's not enough counselors that can sign well, that understand the community fluently. And so they, they don't, aren't able to get the kind of services that most hearing people can get. So we're trying to figure out how to make, you know, like with an, a needle and a thread, how to make a lot of things with, with very little. Um, I have to, to go in about five minutes. So I just want to say, I was, I was, I'm glad you said that Sheila, because I was just going to ask, um, how big the current team is, who's, who are working on this project. Um, and also, um, I just wanted to mention a couple of potential resources before I go. So can you bring Francis forward, Christy, onto the bigger screen so I can see him signing better? Y yes. And uh, okay. I, I, you know, you know, you can use the chat box too to type in any um, thing for him okay. of the resources. So oh, so so so, so Christy suggests Felicia can type in chat name of resource. No, she can't type chat. So Francis. Curious, how many people on your team? So, my team, we had six, six right now, but you went and trained 45 deaf leaders in Zambia. Well, who, so there was six that went in last August, trained 45 deaf leaders, right? So hang on, there's a technical, some technical difficulties. You might have better. So the first year. Oh, go ahead. Curious how many people you have on your team. You said your team six trained 45 deaf leaders. You said they're ready to do more. That was. So most, 
So we gathered at that first summit last August about what do the 45 leaders in, in Zambia need and, and telling us more of what they're looking for and need and what our team came to train in different ways and so that so that you can be ready for, is that what you said? So that we, So also, also because Francis works at a Silicon Valley private high school, a lot of the students' parents work in Silicon Valley in different, in the tech, tech sector. And he won like teacher of the year for that school because he set up, you know, he teaches ASL and he, he has an ASL club. He set up sister city program between that school and you know a school in Zambia he has plans to bring his high school students whose parents want to help funding some of these trips next year to go and volunteer and so he's already helping uh, he has classes that he's set up that are to teach his students how to support uh, students in developing countries like with books and kind of setting up basic infrastructure between these two worlds. And so he's getting, he's, they will be sending 400, 400 pairs of shoes, for example. So he's doing a lot to set the stage, if you're following me. Um, so just Sheila is speaking now about the kind of leadership that this incredible deaf leader has. He, he's not only a Zambian leader or an African leader, he is one of the best global leaders I have ever seen because he knows how to be, use his empathy and compassion to connect all kinds of people and, and people, he, he really inspires people and he, he's, he's, he's just doing amazing things. So, Yay. <laughs> and so thank you for all your, anything you can do to help you know, us and help him be successful. Can, it's really going to have a lot of payoff around the world. We have only 10 to 15% of our deaf kids are learning sign language from their own families because the medical providers are not recommending sign language because they don't sign and understand how important it is. So 85% of our kids are really delayed all over the world. And we have a lot of things to clean up. So we need more deaf leaders like, like him to make the difference. So, so he says, I know you have to leave, Felicia. Thank you for coming on the call and being a part of this conversation. And first, again, I, I want to be sure to thank everybody. And thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Ricardo and Christy. And I want to make sure Ricardo's still there. Yeah, he's still there. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'm, I'm still here. I, I was wondering if I was on or not. Yeah, you're on. Am I? I yeah, I just okay. unmuted you. Yeah. So, so, so he just wants to finish this last, before Felicia leaves. Hang on one second. So, before Felicia leaves, I just want to say be that my, my organization, Give Back to the Community in Zambia, The speed, we're having technical, it's just not the right speed. of It's a weird, slow speed. <laughs> Hang on. Is, is he on a phone, AT&T phone? Yes, we, we really are looking forward to developing this whole village concept, as we call it, because it takes a village, and the way that Ricardo sounds like his whole has this holistic systems thinking is, is of creating a village that is successful and we want to learn more and collaborate more. And we really appreciate you all for your time tonight. It means a lot. Uh, I, I wonder if, um, if I can email the group a couple of resources I'm thinking oh, of sure. rather than sure. sending you the have, chat. Sure. Yeah, that would be okay. Better. You have, 
the are you on the group email did uh yes. ricardo forward you i you think so here? i'll make sure yeah, yeah so, i think you are because i have one main recommendation that i want to make um to a, a consultancy based in australia that does work internationally um and i'm trying to think of how to describe what they do um I just feel like there might be something that their approach would help to um, to to maybe um, like bring out the next level in in a, a the best efficient and wholehearted way that it sounds like your very large uh, or growing project is starting to head toward. Um, they're very thoughtful and they're, they're friends and they're colleagues of mine. And I believe that um, they'd be relatively affordable, I think, um, because they're, they're also Buddhists. <laughs> um, so I, I will include a reference to them in the email. Um, but I, I just wanted to also say that I'm going to include a link to um, a little mini course about systems thinking because right now I'm a one person organization and trying to introduce systems thinking to Marin County is proving to be a way bigger task than just me alone can do. So I'm looking for partners in my work specifically in Marin. Um, and at the same time, I'm very excited about any opportunity to spread the word about systems thinking and the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which I believe help people to think in systems um, beyond Marin as well. So um, I have, so if there's anything I can contribute going forward, then certainly let me know. And I will send that follow-up email um, with, a few, with a few systems thinking resources. Um, yeah, I, I think that's all <laughs> for the moment. <laughs> Well, well, let me just ask this, uh, uh, Sheila, is, do you have any preliminary timelines or any benchmarks? So, you know, Ricardo, I'm going to say year? bye. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Felicia, for well, jumping on. Felicia, thank you. So we're still going to continue, Ricardo. We're just saying goodbye to Felicia. Okay. Thank you. I'll see Felicia. <laughs> okay. So, Ricardo, you wanted to know if there was timelines and benchmarks? Yeah, oh, any, any benchmarks or milestones, you know, within the next year that you want to achieve. He's signing to him. So now, yes, Ricardo want to know your program now have specific timelines. Um, right now, working on that now mm -hmm. yeah, we're working mm -hmm. on, on those things right now as we speak trying to clarify all those things that's what we're working on right now is is mm -hmm. it a possibility um sheila that you and francis especially now that school will be out um in a couple of weeks maybe mid to end of june that you guys could come to marin city we have on fridays um at 10 a.m we have the uh, Martin Luther King Coalition Group meeting, um, which is a lot of the community people that is are involved. It every week or is it every month? It's, it's um, on, yeah, it's every Friday. And then the first Friday of the month is, um, is Ricardo's group that is uh, where, you know, but even just to come and meet with you and you could give a tour and show him the, the thing that you guys have up on the wall about your vision board um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, show him the buildings and the way the school's laid out and, and talk to him about the problems that you found uh, with the way it is and the things that are working and the things that are not working between, you know, how your buildings are structured in relation to the school in relation to the senior center in relation. Mm -hmm. Well, well, the good thing is that uh, you're starting from scratch. Yeah. And yeah, and that's that's strictly an advantage because like I say, if you had a design team, you could design your know, critical paths, 
right and, and you could set up some timelines right we have to, we have to deal with uh, uh old leaders you know who like get stuck you know and we and we have to deal with competitive funding for different organizations and we have to deal with the lack of synchronizations between the different uh, some of the different uh, uh, organizations as well as from the different sectors like the health sector and the educational sector and the uh, uh, civil government sectors and that's what my work is aimed at trying to solidify a a, a systems approach and that's why we use what we're building our police and I we're building what we call an equity accountability database you know that lists everybody within the community what they're doing the contacts their websites their facebooks uh uh, uh the second part of it will list the equity components in their system like do you have a strategic plan do you have an audit you know uh uh do you have an evaluation uh, not only evaluation in numbers but qualitative evaluations where you can ask people how do you feel about the service that the system is providing you know and that's very important so at the end of each well looking at each system you can measure its equity or its equity components and you can tell your investors or your people who are investing time or uh, or money or their souls into this system. This is your reward. This is your payback. <laughs> you, your payback is your an effective systems. In your case, we you know we've graduated people who are very capable of integrating in society, you know, uh, the deaf society, or training training other people to do the same thing, or training the deaf to be able to be more communicative with all levels of society. In other words, they can become immersed in society like everybody else. But like I'm saying, we, 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 we got a, since 1945, uh, Marin City has existed and it's went through so many permutations. Uh, and it's went through so many attempts at community planning. And the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems is, well, you know, you can get around stuck leadership. You know, you can just kind of, keep nudging and nudging them until they see some, something a little bit differently. But the biggest problem is being underwritten financial, uh, you know, financially because uh, systems change, computers change, uh, 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 you need training for interns, you need stipends, you want to, you want to pay volunteers, uh, uh, you want to, you want to keep good managers on board, you know, because you know, the managers people snatch up in a minute. So our biggest thing is we've started a lot of programs and because the funders said we're only going to fund you for two years and that's it. And that's no good. So if you look at, uh, sustainability, you're looking at long range. You got to have a, an intermediate plan or, a five-year plan and a 10-year plan or something that's going to take you into the future and that's going to grow and sustain itself and be a marker of success that investors will not hesitate in, in, in investing in. Or people will not hesitate coming from different parts of the world to visit to see how successful you are. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of moving parts, a lot of communications, a lot of feedback, a lot of people relationships. But the biggest thing is if you if you have a solid bank account. Now, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. I'm saying yeah, you don't want to be able to yeah. get yes, down the road on sure. something and, and you have to stop certain portions because you run out of dollars. So can you put um, Francis on the big screen, Christy, so I can see yeah. what he's saying? So, yeah, Ricardo, um, Francis says, I agree completely. Everything you're saying is what we're, you've said it beautifully from your experience, and that is, you know, we're a new organization, so it helps to hear from someone like you with all this experience, because we're trying to figure out ways to do everything you're saying. Hang mm -hmm. on one well, second. Well, this is a design team. Hang on one second.
So it seems with our new organization, we're depending on volunteers a lot until we get more funding. And so we're trying to mm -hmm. figure out our new, you know, beginning structures and systems of our new volunteer organization mm -hmm. at this point to be able to, yeah. to figure out how to do all the things that you're saying. So thank you. Yeah, it's, lives of it is going to be collecting data, names, and contacts and things like that. You know, it, uh, you, you're not going to be formally institutionalized to X date in the future. And then, not, then the world sure. will change. I'm sorry, Ricardo, Sheila doesn't understand what you just said. I don't know what you just meant by institutionalized. Well, if say, for example, you know, you got five people and one job is, you know, is to find out all the funders. One job is to uh, estimate how many people would, uh, how many deaf people we're going to serve. Uh, one, somebody's going to say, you know, what do we need to know about Zambia? You know, what's the research that we need to know about the area in Zambia and things like that? And, and this, these are this part of what you would call doing the research, you know, collecting the information. And what I meant by institutionalized is when you become a formal organization, and that's when you assign a project manager, you know, over to over in Zambia and a project manager back here, you know, to do all this liaison work that has to take place. And then, you know, then you start talking about staffing and human resources. And then you talk about, you know, the uh, residential part. And you talk about the wellness. It's a huge, you got a huge project ahead of you. And what I'm saying is, like, I believe in contingency thinking. You know, uh, these are the things that should go right. But in case they don't, what's plan B? You see what I'm saying? Yes. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and if you look at all the contingencies, you know, that uh, it, 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 could be, it could be anything. You know, people have to leave for some reason or something like that. You know, but uh, uh, to have the management or the systems in place, you know, where you can establish the type of continuity that you want to be able to reach your milestones. And you want to be able to have what I what I believe in using is what we call progress or performance indicators. And it's not as hard as this is seen. You can just ask local managers, how's your project doing? Do you have these things in place to complete your mission, to reach your outcome and whatnot? It's not it, it, it's some things things that might appear academically hard, but they're not really that hard if you have people that you can rely on to give you good, solid information and whatnot. So, you know, it's, that's why I'm saying, what is your proposed timeline? And how do you propose to look at all these contingencies? Now, I mean, you know, you could always ask me, of course, you can pick up a phone any old time and, you know, and I can, I'm always good at suggestions, you know, that's, that's no problem, you know, but um, uh, you need a roadmap of uh, it's going to take us from today, you know, down to the fruition of a good institution that is operating according to your vision. So I'm going to see if Francis has a response. Can you bring Francis forward? Christy? Yeah. So, um, actually, if he took his vest off, I think it would be easier for you to see the signing. You could ask him to take it. Hang on, hang on, Christy. <laughs> so, you're talking about a roadmap, Ricardo, and. Um, well, there's a plan. I think that uh, we do have some general timelines about some of what we're doing. We have board members that are not. And then we have some people that we're working with in Zambia. Can you mute that, that noise, Christy? 
Yes, and um, maybe if you ask him to take his vest off, you can see his hands better because he has yeah. a dark vest and a. I, I know, I know. I can ask him, but I'm not having. That's not the problem I'm having. Oh, okay. hang, on, hang on one second. So, okay. So, so Sheila, Sheila needs to wrap up maybe in ten minutes. Sheila needs to wrap up in about ten minutes. So you're saying. Francis, okay, so I can So this roadmap, So you're talking about data collection and getting uh, information that we need, having contingency plans, A, B, C, and D, and how to develop the strategic plan. And those are all things that we do need to pay attention to. But I do think that you, you're doing amazing work and you have so much experience, Ricardo, that it's going to be, very helpful to get your input at certain times. And so I, I really appreciate learning from you as like a mentor. So I look forward to visiting, to visiting your Marin city. Um, I don't know what to call it. Complex village. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so that way we can meet in person and I can see, you know, I, it will be great to see what you've accomplished so that I can be thinking more and that will really help me with my, with our work. Thank you. Yeah, and you're, you're unmuted. Oh, uh, okay. I'm unmuted now. Okay. Yeah. Well, I certainly look forward. I, I certainly look forward to sharing whatever I have, you know, cause you know, I'm a, like I said, I'm a few, a couple months off of 80, you know, and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't be taking that lightly, you know, and I still got a little energy left and I certainly want to share whatever I can, if it can be of any use, well, yeah. you know, to anybody, you know, and whatnot. It's, it's, it's says, always worth reaching out. He says that I'm really looking forward to, to taking advantage of and be a sponge and, and <laughs> absorb and grab every every kernel and every crumb of every, every, every piece of bread that you can throw my way that will really help <laughs> me be a better leader to help more people. So I, I really look forward to having more mm -hmm. mentoring and more, more information from your wisdom of, of experience. Thank you. I have, have, have one question. Have you ever talked to an urban planner yet? So he says, he says, I'll just follow, follow in your footsteps. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if you say to talk to an urban planner, I'm going to go talk to one. <laughs> okay. Well, no, 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 no. I'm going to be talking, I'm going to be talking to some folks, you know, uh, uh, also, you know, cause I, I love to pick minds and, you know, and, and because uh, when I told Felicia, you know, she said, oh, yeah, oh, intriguing, intriguing, you know, and I'll be picking some minds and whatnot because I, I knew the mayor of, uh, of Berkeley, Gus Newport, friend of mine, and we were looking at community land trusts, and that's where the community itself owns the land, you know, and uh, uh, and – that way you can stay out of market forces. You can avoid certain market forces, keep housing and keep your institutions affordable because the money that comes in goes into the trust and the trust distributes that money, you know, to, to maintain or to build and whatnot. So I don't know if something like that would be a good tool to have. I know it's a good tool to have over here and it's not used, you know, because, uh, uh, you're helping poor people, and some people don't like to help poor people that much. You know what I mean, Sheila? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot of little tools that are available. 
And, you know, the, the collective impact model that we're trying to use is, you know, tells us how to establish agendas between people, how we share, you know, uh, uh, data, qualitative and quantitative, and how we do what they call, they got the system, so, uh, what, what is called uh, uh, reinforcing, how to reinforce mutually, well, it's mutually reinforcing activities or principles. And that's how you, if you establish a principle like uh, you're going to raise the self-esteem of everybody in the village, you know, uh, a little bit, you know, each month, you know, and, and, and you tell all your leaders, that's exactly what we're going to try to do. And here's some of the language and here's some of the tools that you need to help raise people's sense of self-worth. And that's why, I, that's why I like arts because I think arts is one of those products that help people value themselves and whatnot and, and, and value yourself while you value, value others. So, you know, it, it's a lot of tools like that that could easily be plugged into a new village. <laughs> but it's but it's kind of challenge, you know, to to get old folks, you know, setting their ways or old leaders setting their ways to to adopt new methods. But we have to because the world is changing, you know, fast, and 